you're not responsible, it was wrong, reach out to me. We'll connect you. I will never see, speak, or hear from Aaron Smith Levin for the rest of my life. I've been raised since the age of four to follow orders, do as I was told, or risk losing everything. If we speak out, that's the only way they're going to get the strength to have the courage to do the same. Why the hell someone has to escape to get out of a religion? I'm still shocked by the evil. This is pure evil at work. Okay, welcome to Come Get Some Extra Scientology Edition today with part one of Christy Gordon. This is one I've been trying to get for a while. And uh, tomorrow, Saturday, December 22nd, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, I get another one I've been trying to get for a while. Um, it's been kind of touch and go uh, emotionally uh, for this woman, uh, Lori Hodgson. For the first time in a year and a half, will speak out about her children being taken away from her and the fact that she still can't get in touch with them. Uh, this connection, very huge part of the uh, of Scientology and a very big part of uh, of a, a place of a, a probably very low point in depression during the holidays. You know, you don't have your family, brothers, sisters, mothers, daughters, fathers, all, all these people and uh, disconnected over a supposed religion. So uh, that would be tomorrow. Uh, you'll be hearing from Lori Hodgson. We'll try to turn a mother's heartbreak into a mother's hope and hope for all who have disconnected families uh, going into the next year here. Uh, so there has been some interesting things going on. Um, I did attend the Take Back Clearwater event last Thursday, uh, a little over a week ago there now, uh, where uh, there was a party on Cleveland Street at the Lucky Anchor uh, Irish Pub and Grill with uh, uh, ran by owner Clay Irwin. So uh, you know Aaron Smith Levin was there and Christy Colburn and uh, Mike Rinder, Mary and David Kahn, a few other people sprinkled in who are ex who uh, who aren't such public figures, some protesters, some people who have quite a storied history in Scientology, and a ton of never ends like myself uh, coming to uh, to support even people from out of town. The support Clearwater taking their streets back, and uh, I was at the Lucky Anchor. You may have heard me talk about that months ago on a Thursday. Dead. It was dead. There was a few people, maybe two or three people. The streets were empty, and then you know this event was another Thursday, but it was crowded. It was alive. It was vibrant. Music was playing. People were having a good time. It looked like a, a place where people live. You know, and it was people taken back. So they're looking at having more events like that, possibly bringing more people from out of town uh, that you may want to meet and talk to. Uh, plus, on the next event, nothing's set in stone yet, but I may be podcasting live from the event. Could be my first attempt at a YouTube uh, at a YouTube broadcast. So keep an eye out for details on that right now. Nothing's set in stone, nothing settled, uh, but that's what I'm looking at. Whew, so this uh. Danny Masterson stuff, man. We've been talking about how you know he's a he, you know, he's alleged rapist, but I'm pretty sure he did it. And he outed him and his publicist Jennifer Wyman outed uh, Chrissy Bixler, and they've been uh, she's been seeing harassment ever since. It's important to remember Chrissy Bixler's been married for ten years. She's happily married, um, has two kids, and a nice uh, you know. I don't think she's fighting or struggling to make bills or anything. I think she's living a pretty good life without having to have Scientology harass her and other people who don't understand harass her uh, on social media. So I think that's kind of disgusting. I think it's deplorable. And I think it speaks a lot to, hey, this person is not looking for money. This person gains nothing from bringing down Danny freaking Masters in. Like most people I talk to don't even remember Hyde from that 70s show, don't know who I'm talking about. And you know, now coming out of nowhere, you know, we, we knew a three, then there was four, now a fifth victim coming out, um uh, Bobette Reales, I hope I say her last name correctly, comes out and says, Hey, I've seen this woman get harassed and beat up on social media. I say beat up, but Chrissy can handle herself. And she says, You know what? I was raped repeatedly by the man and I'm tired of being quiet about it. So, you know, applaud the to, to Bobette. Um I you know, I understand the sentiment of guilt, innocent to proven guilty. But there comes a time where you have to take in consideration the claim. 
you know, how many? Two, three, four? In some cases, we won't get the details, 19, 16. Um, at some point, you have to start looking at the accused. And I know it's it's not, you know, not trial by uh, trial by media or trial by popular opinion, but the fact of the matter is where there's smoke, there's fire. You got five women with similar stories, uh, a, a pattern being shown of behavior, and uh, no one's looking for money. It's just justice. In Scientology, will have you think it's a bigoted attempt to attack a religion. If you've been listening to the show, if you've been watching the Aftermath, if you've been following the Scientology story, covering up a rape for PR reasons is no joke, and it's, it's no strange thing. It's not unusual. Uh, the last thing I would ever do – don't get, get me wrong. I don't want to be accused of something I didn't do. I don't want other people to be accused of something they didn't do. But I'm never going to go to someone that says I've just been raped or I was raped three years ago or five years ago, eight years ago. I'm never going to go to them and say, liar. What kind of piece of shit do I have to be to accuse somebody of lying before I know all the facts? But when I hear four, five, 16, whatever the number is, I got to start looking at it a little bit more objectively and say, you know what? This guy might be guilty. So um, all the support in the world to you ladies and to the, uh, anyone else who's been a – sexually assaulted, whether it be under the guise of PR in Scientology, in the coverage of Scientology, or just in the regular world. Uh, big movement, of course, the Me Too movement. Uh, there are men too. And uh, just uh, everybody stay strong and keep fighting because uh, that's when things change is when people get noisy. So uh, I'm glad to see so many people speaking up. So without further ado, remember tomorrow, Lori Hodgson, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and uh, here's Christy Gordon, part one. All right. Today I'm fortunate enough to have uh, one of the first people to ever reach out to me when I started working on uh, doing podcasts about Scientology. Uh, she's become a pretty good friend, and I'm glad to have her here. Thank you for coming on the show here, Christy Gordon. Thanks, Chris. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, I'm just... Uh, yeah, you know, I've been trying to get... It's so funny because I asked you to come on back when I had Kathy Schenkelberg on, and you were like, no... <laughs> and then uh, it's like you've, you've kind of done a, had a little bit of a of an evolution over the last uh, year, uh, getting up to the point to where you feel the need to talk now. I mean, you don't really feel the need to talk, but you're willing to talk and tell your story. I'm not a good speaker, and I can just think of a million people that would do a better job. So that's really my reluctance. It's not so much that I don't support or want to share. I just I have a I have a little, a little hang-up on it, but I'm, I'm so glad to be here, and I'm really, really happy to do, to share anything that would make a difference to anybody else. Absolutely. What Was was going on the aftermath a, a boost for you to get your confidence up to speak? Um, going on aftermath was pretty terrifying, actually. I was um, considering leaving up until the moment that the cameras turned on. I... Oh. I Again, I'm not a public speaker, and I do better in the background. It's just not my thing. Um, uh, it's not my strength. So, so, but yes, of course, practice makes perfect. The more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it, and I know that's true. And that you know could be some part of why I'm willing. Actually, I'm willing to do this because I listened to your interview with Claire Headley, and I thought it, it was so wonderful. You did such a good job. And your interview style with her, I just went, oh, my God, he's going to take care of me. I can do this. I won't look like an idiot. You won't. Hopefully. You won't. I can tell you this, and thank you for saying that. But um, I, I've talked to you quite a bit off the air, and um, I'm pretty sure you're going to sound all right. We, this is actually our second go. I've been, people know I've been having some audio issues. Uh, so we're, it's our second go at this interview. You did so perfect the first time. This one's going to be uh, no less uh Impressive, I think. <laughs> I think it would be better. Thank you. You're welcome. We're getting good at this. Yeah, yeah we got this. <laughs> so, so um, you're are, are you kind of, and maybe I'm just like forgetting. Are you kind of a third generation? Because I think your grandparents got in. Am I wrong on that? So my aunt was first in. She aunt. Got my mother in. Okay. Mm-hmm. My, oh, so my aunt joined, um, got into Scientology in 1968, and then joined the Sea Org immediately with her husband at the time. And then my mother was suffering from postpartum after my birth, 
um, and psychosis also, so it was pretty extreme. And my grandmother, who was a registered nurse, tried to help her and it just didn't seem to be going anywhere. So she called my aunt and said, can you please come help with your sister? So she came home from the ship Apollo to help and got my mother into Scientology. And pretty quickly, my grandmother also got in, which then um, my grandfather was not okay with any of it, disagreed with everything, was completely critical, so was considered antagonistic. And... Um, you can't be around anyone who's antagonistic. So, um, we, so it started tearing our family up from the beginning. My grandmother separated from him and moved out. We couldn't have contact with them. But so, yes, my grandmother was in, and she, my mother and grandmother joined staff almost right away. But I don't know that that – I think that means that three generations of my family was in, but I don't think it makes me the third generation in that – Not technically, you know. Not technically. In other words, I only lived through, you know, my mother being in and then me being in, my grandmother being in at the same time, but not, not you know, three full generations of experience in it. It's very, it's, it's, it's very interesting because, um, yeah, I must have mixed up the aunt and the grandmother, but I, I remember uh, reading a story about you where your your aunt was real important to her to have people around her who were open-minded, and that is a term I hear used a lot when you hear from Scientologists that are trying to fight with the critics saying, you know, you're not open-minded enough. So it's, it's like that whole thing, like, well, if you don't believe what we're saying, you must not be thinking very open-minded, you know. Well, what's funny about that is in Scientology, open-minded is a, is a bad word. Uh, Hubbard so said that. You would say, yeah, someone being open-minded means... Um, uh, they're not clear enough on what's correct, basically. Oh, stop being open-minded. It's, it's actually an insult. It's a bad thing to be open-minded, not a good thing. Now, outside of Scientology, obviously, it's a good thing. Like yeah. reasonable. Exactly. To, 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 exactly. Reasonable, same thing. Reasonable in Scientology is a bad thing. You're, you're opening the door to, you know, perversion um, <laughs> if you're reasonable versus, you know, being open to everything, not being closed-minded would be the truth. So he just perverted those words, basically. So these things are in keeping Scientology working. Uh, that's why I recognize them. I read that recently. And the whole thing with that is that, yeah. you know, it's like he's saying, if, if you if you look at it <laughs> with an open mind, if you look at it from the perspective of you're not trying to follow his word and you're just trying to be critical of what he's writing, he's basically mm -hmm. saying, just listen to me and everything else will be okay. <laughs> exactly. So, and that's what they did. That is what they did. <laughs> even Even when it caused conflict within them. Uh, you know, my mother struggled and struggled, and you could see her struggling. She she wanted to believe what LRH said, but some of it went against her core feelings and beliefs, discriminating against people, harming people because it was the greatest good. She fought it, but and, and it, it causes cognitive dissonance. And in some people, like my mother, it literally tears you apart. It causes you, you to splinter and she wasn't strong enough to deal with that, but um, that is what he does. Yeah. So you did mention uh, you've mentioned that before how your uh, mother's behavior changed, how you knew your mother changed uh, almost overnight after uh, joining staff. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so although she had postpartum and she was kind of withdrawn and confused and having some psychosis when I in my earliest memories, um, we knew she loved us. She was. Um, she nurtured us. She told us stories before bed. She snuggled with us. She was there, you know. Um, sometimes she was sad, but it didn't have anything to do with us. Um, and then after Scientology, as she started learning these principles, she started pulling away from us and treating us very differently, um, you know, that we were, had to be responsible for ourselves and that we were, you know, um, ageless spirits and small bodies and, and um it just changed, and it felt as if that nurturing and that love was gone from our lives all of a sudden. And then my grandmother getting in was the same thing. Um, she began to change, and we felt it. It was palpable, um, and we didn't understand it, and we just knew that life was different now, you know. Life is different now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those differences include cleaning your own diapers in the toilet at two years old. Um, so... So that was an early lesson for me, but I didn't know any different. 
you know, I just knew that now I was being told that I had to be self-sufficient. Now we were being left home alone, and, and that meant in order for my mother to do this really important thing, she kept stressing how important this job she was doing now was clearing the planet and help, helping Ellen Hubbard and being kind, um, that my part in that was being independent. And so for her to be away, we had to make our own meals and clean up after ourselves and finish our cycles and um, get ourselves to and from daycare or then school and, you know, wash my diapers out in the toilet. Is that a normal thing anyway? Like, I've never had uh, cloth diapers. <laughs> so I've never dealt with that. Is that actually is cleaning in the toilet actually the right way to do it? Oh, no. I'm not even I sure. Have, I didn't have kids, but no, I'm sure it's not. That's disgusting. But um, I just totally dated myself with cloth diapers, right? Right. <laughs> well, I think they still yeah. exist. <laughs> I think they do. Real green people probably use uh, cloth diapers. But sure. Yeah. Anyway, so I didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. We didn't know. Well, this is just what we were being told that was right now, that was the thing to do. And so we just tried to do what we were told. There was a lot of it didn't feel good to us. We didn't like being left home alone. We saw other kids that weren't left home alone, you know. And as years went by, we started to see, you know, families spent time together and families had something called the family vacation, which we never had. And, family vacation? Um, I, we never went on a family vacation. I didn't know what that was. You know, I knew that you had summer vacations from school, but I didn't know you got to go anywhere together. Or, you know, kids had their own bedroom, or they didn't wear only clothes from the Goodwill, or, you know, their parents helped them with homework. I, we didn't know any of that. We So so you only know what you know. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, so your mother was convinced that no matter what, uh, being uh, a, a grown person million years on this planet or in this world, in this universe, you should be able to handle the utensils, the can opener, the blender, the stove. All these things should be fine for you. So he teaches them, Ellen Hubbard teaches you that you just need to regain the abilities, that you already have these abilities because you lived many, many lives as a Satan and you just came back and picked up this new child body. Um, and you have to regain the ability. So your parent would might maybe go through it with you one or two times, and then it's for you to do. You, you regain that ability. Regain the ability. He says that about babies, too. He says babies are just playing dumb, yeah. basically. Yeah. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he says. Um, yeah. That's the true story. Go, if you if you go to, um, just to people listening, go to Mace Kingsley, look up the, uh, there's another website for it, but I think it's on there, too, about auditing babies. And you'll see the actual. I mean, it's so. Is it surreal to you now that you believe that you you believe it because it's all you knew, and now you look back and go, "Wow!" It says it right there. You can just see what it's saying. It's saying babies are playing dumb <laughs> when you read the, the LRH, LRH's words on it. They post it. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's insane. But it's a funny thing when you're experiencing it. There's some part of it that's empowering. You're being told that you're a giant, powerful spirit, and you can do these things. And who doesn't like to feel pumped up and you know, sure. that? And then there's the, the other part of you that's like, wait, wait, I'm just a kid. I I don't know how to tie my shoes. I don't I don't want to walk myself to school. I I don't know how to deal with strangers. You know, I I I don't want to be left with strangers. So it's you're torn. Um, and 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 that plays into it all the way through when you're recruited into the Sea Org. I mean, every time they kind of boost you, boost your ego, it feels good, and yet you're terrified, and it feels wrong and good at the same time, if that makes any sense. Sure, sure, and I think it plays right into the uh, the, the cognitive uh, dissonance, right? Totally, and with adults too, not just kids. You know, you, you, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel right, and yet it's so ego-stroking. It's it's addictive to keep being told how wonderful and powerful you are. Addictive's a good word. So, yeah, yeah. So so what I think is you know you're, you're talking about you know even as the as, as as someone who isn't insane <laughs> that doesn't have mental why well, say insane but doesn't have some kind of mental flaw um, mm-hmm. or a disability uh, someone who's not mm-hmm. bipolar or or going through what your mother was going through um, yeah. if you're just sane this will mess with your head. This will mess you up. 
imagine what that does when you have these things like postpartum and bipolar. Um, and, and and I look at your mother because it's so interesting. There, I know there's other parents like your mother. Um, we've heard a lot about from people, a lot of people whose parents just just didn't worry about them anymore. Once they went into staff or Sea Org, they just didn't. They weren't concerned anymore. Dropped the kids off at the cadet org. But mm-hmm. but it seems like your mother was a combination of indifferent and caring. Like she still cared. She still had an interest in in, in your well being, but she also. Uh, just follow the letter of the law, the word of Elron Hubbard, to the point to where it was negligent at some point for, for some time. She was so conflicted um, and trying to... She, she's very much um, loyal. And, 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 and when she does something, she does it 100%. She doesn't waffle. She's completely invested. And so... <clears throat> She tried so hard to believe and to follow to the letter, regardless of you know the outcome. But you could see how conflicted she was, because she was a kind, good person. Um, and imagine that. I mean, it, it's hard enough to imagine a kind, good person in Scientology. I mean, you start out <laughs> with it, Scientology seeming kind and good, and then along the way, you have to start, you know, lines start being drawn in the sand. Oh, this person's not good enough. This person's degraded. This person, you know isn't going to make it this lifetime, and you start separating yourself out to all, all these different classes. And, and then once you join the Sea Org, it gets even way worse. And then once you go up the bridge and become OT, it gets even way worse until there's so much that's not good and kind about it. And she made it up to OT7 and, wow. and you know, got into the Sea Org. And so she had to straddle those things. And it, I think even to a, a really he- mentally healthy person, it's so hard. And to someone who is fragile, like I know now she was, it's too hard. It just it just splits you apart. You you know that she had a big conscience and a big heart, and that's not good in Scientology. You you can't have those. They things feed on that. Um, in sense of yeah, you, you, that that's painful. Um, so so uh, yes. Yeah. She did put us in positions that um, were dangerous, and she did, um, you know, she had a role in our neglect, and to a certain point she abandoned us. Um, She thought she was doing the right thing, and there's no doubt in my mind that she did. She was not narcissistic. Um, She didn't have a mean bone in her body. Everything that she did was to follow Scientology, and it killed her to do it. Um, and, and we're very fortunate in that that we had we had a parent that that was good. She just was, you know, misdirected and, and misled. It's, it's it's just terrible to think about. I mean, uh, I know she uh, she left you alone with the cat as the babysitter. No, no. Yeah. The cat yeah, was, was your babysitter. How 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 did you interpret? How how did you? How, how, what would you would you make of that <laughs> when that happened? Well, I think at that point our lives were very much about, you know, spiritual things. So that's what she was teaching us about at that point after she got into Scientology. And, and so everything was kind of some weird magical story. Um, and so her telling us that the cat would, you know, be responsible for us and protect us, eh, that wasn't too far of a stretch. I mean, wow. <clears throat> I don't know, you know, whatever. Um, you know. I have no idea. That was insane. No, no. It's, it's, it's what happens is, and this is something that people don't think about. And um, I, I, I think maybe I'm a paranoid parent, but I think this could be a very common thing if not checked or kept in check. But you open your, yourself up to opportunities for predators when you leave your kids with other people that you don't know, and uh, that's something that was part of your story. Uh, something that your mother did, but it was because she had no other choice. She couldn't do the, she couldn't go do her job, and just leave you there. She had to leave you with somebody. So that you know happened. It's such a blend of things that caused that to happen. One, yes, yeah, she had two kids. She was a single parent, and she had joined staff. And so now she's got these huge. They really do put huge demands on you. Like the world is going to end. Mankind might not make it, you know, if we don't all do our part now. And they just jam that down your throat. 
at every muster, at every meeting, every day they drive that home, and, and you begin to believe it. And they're and serious. In a really, they're and serious. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not something they're saying. It, it's something they're serious about. No, no, and it comes from the top down, and L. Ron Hubbard keeps repeating it in all of his, you know, bulletins and and letters to you and, and tapes, and it, it's just, it's repeated over and over again, and you begin to believe it. So she was very fragile and um, gullible, I'll say, at that point. And um, so, so, so she's got that drive, and then she's got that every penny is going to her getting up the bridge because she wants to be redeemed. She wants this mental health and this happiness and these powers that they're promising her. So, of course, she's spending every penny. There's no money left for child care. So once my grandmother got in and was on, full, on course full-time and becoming an auditor and then on staff, and my grandfather was not available because he was antagonistic, well, that didn't leave anyone to watch us. And so that meant home alone or with anyone who was available. So that could be the landlord, that could be the neighbor across the hall, that could be a nice person, that could be a not-so-nice person. And so, yes, we were left with a couple of different men <clears throat> on occasion that we didn't know, and they did end up molesting my sister and I. And um, it didn't go on for very long. We told our mother because we knew it was wrong, and we weren't left with him again, but I feel I feel 100% that it was directly caused by the Scientology influence, the demands that were made on her and the demands that were made on her finances, and the fact that she was being taught that we should be responsible for ourselves, that we were immortal beings in small bodies, and that if we pulled anything in and anything negative happened to us, it was because we caused it ourselves. The pull it in, so that's yeah. What she's, exactly. So that's what she's being taught. And so that made her feel safe and free leaving us with strangers for home alone. But your mother, to her credit, she wasn't upset with you for what happened to you, was she? Oh, God, no. I mean... See, according um, to L. Ron Hubbard, she should have thought that you did something wrong. So you're, to your mother's credit... Yeah, I, I don't know. She did not handle us with ethics when, when those uh, two things happen. Good. As, do, as does happen. With, I've heard, you know, a lot of other kids that were in situations, maybe when they were older, um, that were sexually molested or um, in the sea organization or were raped, um, that there's a lot of that. My mother did not do that to us. She just removed us from those people and didn't let Good. Us, I mean, it's um, not good it happened, anymore. but yeah. Yeah, no, no, we've, you know, got in trouble many other ways, but that was not one of them. That's not one of them, okay. Yeah. So, something I never heard before, like I talk about how Claire Haley says she was working at six years old, and so that, as a matter of fact, you know, you uh, you and your sister at four and five year old, five years old were walking to to daycare, to the nursery. I've never yeah, heard so of children that age walking by yourselves. So, again, she would... Sh- show us once or twice how to get there and and you know no, I mean, nothing was different she had to get to the org to be on post she had to be doing her auditing and her courses that was the number one priority in the world and so you know we we were not how long so, was that and, that walk? And, and we were little adults in small bodies again i mean everything is justified everything yeah. is justified if you believe that crap um i'm going to say we did that for probably four or five months before we moved. Um, How far was it? Been to that, uh, it was eight blocks. Eight blocks, wow. Where we lived. Okay. Yeah. yeah, eight blocks, but the shortcut was through this really beautiful but dark park, mm. little tree-lined, and we went that way a couple times before um, homeless people that lived in the bushes would jump out and just terrify us. So oh, wow. We ended up going a long way. Um uh, but we had already gone to an unlicensed daycare that was just a bunch of Scientology parents trying to do the right thing and actually have care for their kids that was affordable. So they rented an apartment in downtown San Francisco. and But it was like 12 kids to one parent. That's too um, much. 
so we got kicked out of that when I climbed up on a dresser in a room I wasn't supposed to be in because I was not being supervised because there were too many of us and um, ended up in the emergency room uh. concussion. Um, so some, some parents tried to do the right thing. How, how much of, uh, well, I mean, not how much, but how was the uh, the daycare, the nursery? It was it in good shape, bad shape? The Scientology co-op or the, the, the daycare that we walked to? Um, the one where the parents, one parent, or the one they rented out. <clears throat> it was just totally an apartment, like a bare-bones apartment that had a couple cribs and a couch and a television, and that was it. Um, oh. Some food in the kitchen, but not even, I don't even remember that there was a table. You know, it was all they could do to just split the rent of this apartment and then try and be present However, what they would have they shared six or eight hours a day per parent. Because you couldn't get proper care on the money you made in <clears> staff, <throat> basically. No, no. They, because they were being forcefully wretched at the org every time they went in to buy libraries, to buy services. So there's no money for child care. Yeah, that's interesting because I don't think a lot of people think of this, and I don't usually think of this, but like you lived a very much, very much like a uh, cadet org life before you ever set foot in the cadet org. <clears throat> so I would say any parent that was really um, heavily indoctrinated and devout, which some of our parents were, had that same life, that that same childhood, even outside of the sea org. I know so many kids now that I've found and and, and listened to stories of that had equally damaged childhoods outside of the sea organization. Even as, like, public kids. Because their parents believed every word Ellen Hubbard said, and they just wanted to be devout because they wanted the things that were promised. Right. If you did these things, if you lived your life this way, you would be happy and healthy. You would be prosperous. You'd be saving mankind. You'd, You'd... have special powers. I mean, there's all these promises, and they wanted those things. And the more they didn't get them when they did the services, the, the more they were told that they didn't do it right, that they, you know, they didn't follow the policies close enough. And so they, they're trying to self-correct and enforce these things harder and harder in their lives, which includes their children, obviously. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, plenty of public kids have a really, really horrible childhood. I'm trying to remember uh, what came first, the uh, working at staff with your mom or the cadet org? So we, as we got into trouble um, when we were five and six, she started um, having us report to the ethics officer at the San Francisco org instead of um, doing it herself with us, instead of disciplining us herself. Oh, wow. And... Yeah, so, and it was, you know, we were taught to shop with by some neighbors. We were hungry, and we were on food stamps, and we we started stealing food from the corner store. Um, we threw balloon, water balloons off the roof. I mean, just stupid kid stuff, some of it. Um, and so we began being made to come to the org after school and on weekends and uh, either do ethics because we had been bad so that meant scrubbing things, polishing things. Um, it was an old building with big marble floors and staircase and brass hardware. So we'd just, you know, be on the floor scrubbing and polishing, people walking over us. Or um, writing up our Overton withholds, just, you know, locked in offices, just writing up everything that we could think of that we had done that was bad or bad thought we had. Um and then eventually, I think, I think we just figured out that we were a resource, that we could actually do stuff. And so we began being made to come in and just help anyway, um, working on evolutions um, of the magazine. They did a magazine, I don't know how frequently it was, I can't really recall, but called Gateway Magazine that came from the San Francisco org. And we would collate, or I would, I used the industrial, the commercial stapler, got stuck in it. Um, <sighs> horrible, went through my thumb, Um, and we would just work all night doing white gloves, preparing for missionaires, but 
Al Rach would send to come. Um, we were sent out on street corners, of course. All kids were um, need to do this, hand out um, tests and flyers um, in really horrible, horrible parts of um, San Francisco. Um, and that was one of our least favorite things to do. Um, and just work there. And we would just work. You were and working. And fall asleep in the corner. Yeah. You were like staff. You know, they would have... At seven, no, not, we, six. Weren't, we weren't considered staff. But, but you were we doing were the work. Parents, we were sent on coffee runs. We were made to cover the reception desk. We emptied garbages. We um, we were treated like little staff members because mm-hmm. yeah, we were there so much. Sleeping we in the corner. Doctors. What you said? They sleep in the corner. Well, we would work until we couldn't keep our eyes open anymore. We wow. Fall asleep in the corner until our mom would, you know, we'd stumble home with our mom or whatever. Usually around 11 or 12, but sometimes 2 and 3. And on Wednesday night, which is the last day of the week, um, Thursday at 2 is when your statistics have to be in. And in Scientology, your statistics must be up above the last week. So people stay up overnight getting things done. So Wednesday nights we would sometimes be there until 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes we'd be, she would go home with us. Sometimes she wouldn't. We'd be walked home by other staff members. Occasionally we walked home by ourselves if there was no one available to go home with us. Um, we ended up hitch, you know, being offered a ride one time by some strangers in a nice car that then locked us in and wouldn't let us out. So we're almost kidnapped. Um, we had, you know, people called truant officers, not truant officers, but um, the police because we were out after curfew when we were six and seven. Um, we had to walk by, we lived on Knob Hill at one point, and had to walk by this really rowdy bar where guys would be outside puking and drunk and making out, and we'd have to go by them, and they would really razz us. That was pretty scary. Seven um, years old, six and seven, rousing you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, just, you know, it was stuff kids shouldn't be doing. Or, or exposed to. Um yeah. So, so you're little staffers, not officially. They're putting you right. to work like they do the regular staffers. You fall asleep in the corner. Um, did they give you a break on that? Did they? Did it matter that you fall asleep in the corner? No, because at that point it was so late. You know, it was okay to go to sleep. It was your mom working extra, basically. It, yeah, it was. It was. It allowed my mother to stay into the night <clears throat> and work. So it was. A, it was a solution. It wasn't something that we were disciplined for. We, we weren't really staff. We were just. They were keeping us busy because we got in trouble home alone, or we shouldn't mm-hmm. have been home alone. But doing you know, stuff you shouldn't we be doing, <laughs> having ethics applied to us, and doing lower conditions, and doing amends projects to make up the damage that we've done to our group by, you know, doing something bad that drew a negative attention to us that could be bad public relations for Scientology. Now I'm going to ask you this question not because I know the answer, but because. It just makes sense to ask this question in the realm of Scientology. What was the punishment for stapling your thumb? So I was, I fell asleep was the reason that it happened. Um, And so, you know, it was really upsetting. My sister and I were the only ones in the room, and this giant commercial stapler, and it's keeping going. It's going, and it's in my thumb, and I couldn't make it stop. I couldn't get my thumb out. I couldn't scream. My sister was collating, so she wasn't facing me. And I'm just going, ah, 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 you know. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, and she finally turned around and saw me and started screaming for an adult, and there were two rooms away. So it took a while for anybody to come and get me disengaged from this thing. But I was really upset about it. I couldn't catch my breath. I couldn't stop crying. I don't know why it upset me so much. But you had a staple in your thumb? Was, <laughs> what? You had a staple in your thumb, uh, maybe? Well, it was a big thing. I had a whole huge magazine oh. into my so I mean, I was a oh. machine attached to this big magazine. It wasn't just like a little staple through my thumb. It was mm-hmm. a deal, but, um, and I was, you know, five or six. So, so anyways, I was really upset about it. And um, the first thing you do is a contact assist, which is a Scientology assist, which <laughs> I hated anyway because they didn't actually help in my experience, and some people might disagree, but you have to basically recreate the situation. So 
go ahead to stick my finger, bleeding finger, back in the what? stapler in the magazine and do it exactly no. like it happened, <laughs> only not, not push it so it puts the staple through, but just recreate it. And you have to do it over and over and over until it feels better. And I didn't want to do it. <laughs> so I'm screaming, yelling, I don't want to do it. Stick my finger back in there. And and at that point, it's called missy motion. I'm, I'm, you're not really supposed to have emotions that are below a certain level on the tone scale, the scale of emotions that L. Ron Hubbard created. And grief is one of them. <clears throat> you're not supposed to be there. It's it's called below tone, and it's, you, get, you, know, you, you get shamed for that. So... I'm, I don't care. I'm upset. I don't want to do this thing, and I'm creating and yelling. They're traumatizing you. Oh, totally. Oh, totally. Now, you would look at that and go, what the F are you people doing? That's insane. This kid was just injured. They shouldn't be here. They shouldn't be up at this hour. They shouldn't be laboring. They shouldn't be injured, and you shouldn't be making them do it over and over and over again, especially if they don't want to. It would be different if you went, yeah, 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 let me stick my finger back in that thing. <laughs> but... um. <laughs> So, so, but then in Scientology, when, because I made a big deal out of it, I made a big fuss, it drew in a crowd, people came in, what's the screaming, what's happening, my mother, you know, um, it was, a, you know, I created a, a little flap, I created a scene. So then it was, how, you know, why did you do that? How did you pull that in? Um, so it's victim blaming um, in any other place besides Scientology, and you have to talk about what thing you did bad that caused that thing to happen to you. So you end up then being punished, having to write overs and whistles, having to talk about who you might be connected to that might be the reason that you might be sick, or what thoughts you're having that might have you know, made you pull in bad things. So it's, it's, it's a bad ending to you know something that shouldn't have happened to begin with. It's, it's interesting because that's what they that's what they wanted to do, right? So so you stapling your magazine into your thumb with the industrial staples is because somebody says something negative about Scientology or somebody in your life is is, is a bad influence. It's just misdirection. It's just it, ma- it makes no sense. But it's what they, mm-hmm. it's what it, it's what they want you to do, though. I mean, so so okay. if you talk to a Scientologist and you ask them about this connection, they'll downplay it. They'll say it's not like that big a thing. It's a mutual mm-hmm. decision, all this stuff. And really, mm-hmm. in situations like this, and there's lots of situations where people get injured or do something wrong or questionable or have a, make a mistake, mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. it influences and encourages this connection. I mean, it starts with the PTS, it, right, the potential trouble yeah, source. It, it, yes. It, oh, yeah, potential trouble source. You're, you're constantly... So that's a perfect segue into when my mother finally disconnected from me years, years later. Her Scientology wasn't working, and she was desperately trying to figure out why. It's called finding the why. She's trying to figure out why. She's OT7, but she doesn't have these powers, and she's not mentally well, and she's not happy, and she's not prosperous, and she can't afford to eat or pay her own rent. Um, So they start looking for reasons within and without and removing, insulating themselves from anyone that might have said anything that's not pro survival or pro Scientology, or so it, it. It there's no escape from that. There's no point where you can go, whew, okay, I can get out of that, and, and this makes sense, and this feels feels good. It's constant and chronic that you're trying to find within yourself the reason why things don't work the way they're promised or things aren't good in your life and, and that includes your children and your parents and your spouse and wow. you know, it never inc- it never includes Scientology. Scientology is never the reason. So you get the OT7. Wrong. It's crazy. Yeah, you go to OT7. It can't be the thousands of dollars you spent and the years you put into it that, that, that Scientology doesn't make good in their promise. You can't go mm-hmm. external because something, something in your life is, is bringing you down. Mm-hmm. No, you would never consider Scientology. And if you did, then if you voiced some concern like that, <clears throat> like this process didn't really work for me or I'm not really sure this is legitimate, or, I, you know, if you question it in any way, then <clears throat> you'd be given, it, it'd be more victim blaming. You'd go, oh, you must need the PTSFT rundown. 
you must need the false purpose rundown. You, they've got, they, they have, you know, if you did a, you did a little, I forget what it's called, um, <clears throat> if this then that, basically. They have got this set up so well that if this then that, it constantly is pointing back to you, costing you more money, causing you to, you know, um, self-reflect and find, it, it's just constant victim blaming over and over and over again and creating monsters where there are no monsters, creating monsters within your family, creating monsters within your community, creating monsters within the medical industry, creating monsters within the government, creating monsters in your own house until you no longer trust your own thoughts and feelings. Wow, that's a great way to put it. You can't be trusted. You cannot be trusted. You must only follow the policy and and, and what L. Ron Hubbard says to the letter, the only way to survive. Does it ever occur to you uh, as a Scientologist uh, and you're a practicing Scientologist that you're always being blamed for pulling stuff in? Do you ever wonder why it is that people being uh, douchey pedophiles aren't pulling in being douchey pedophiles? Just for example. I don't I don't think when you're in that you consider that too much. I think it takes a long time to, to even think that way because you're so programmed and indoctrinated not to ever consider. You don't even yeah. consider it. Wow. Yeah. No, you don't even think that. You don't go there because you know you're not allowed to. <clears throat> um, later you for sure do um, once you're willing to look at things again. Um, but, but so I was just reading something the other day and it rang really true to me and it was talking about how, I was talking about how if you complain about certain things, then you're accused of having, in Scientology they would call it similars of your own. So let's say I say, Chris was really an asshole to me the other day. He, um, you know, flirted with me and I'm married and he knows better. Well, then Scientology's answer that, to that would be, oh, really? Well, you're nattering, talking badly, and third-partying, talking behind the back of what have you done that's similar? So instead of addressing this issue, this thing that happened, they just keep you going in circles now, looking into why you were uncomfortable with that thing happening and how sometime, maybe not this lifetime, but in your past lifetime, you did the same thing, which, which just buys them more auditing hours. So now, in order to do more money. self-reflection, yeah. I have to pay you more money to do confessionals on this thing that I now mentioned to you is an issue with me. So now we can spend months going down this road instead of actually addressing the problem. So I think it's just sleight of hand in this direction, honestly. By design. And and what, it, right? By design. And what it does though is it constantly reinforces that you cause all your own problems. And so you're never, you, you, it stops you from looking around you, it stops you from looking outside unless you're doing the PTS, you know, SP thing, who am I connected to, who might be, you know, causing these problems for me or making me upset or making these things not work in my life. Um, so you're, you're paranoid about people around you except for Scientology and you're paranoid about yourself constantly, constantly. Wow. It's the opposite of any religion that I've ever heard of, that's spiritual and you let these problems go to a bigger power and you just do your best. It's so the opposite. It's so, hmm, to, a, to, to, to an organic level. Um, so destructive. That's just, wow. <laughs> Did you... Um... Did you write a letter to L. Ron Hubbard to fuck off? <laughs> I Kind of as I said earlier, I started to kind of notice that kids that weren't in Scientology around me had a different life than we did. And I, um, at a certain point, I was angry about it. Um, and I, you know, he was in charge of everything, so I figured he must be responsible. Um, it seemed like he had caused a lot of hardship in our lives, and I, yeah, I was angry. You're smart. There's a little, uh huh. There's a little desk in every org, every mission, or I, I, don't, I guess there's not. I don't know. I haven't been in one since 1989, but 
um, there used to be with a sign, you can always communicate with me. And it was a big portrait of him, and it was a desk, and it was a nice pen and a nice chair, and you would sit down and you would write to him. You can always communicate to me, and you'd drop it in a little box. And I just, you know, I'd learned some really bad language around the org. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I just wrote, you know, in my little scratchy <laughs> six-year-old handwriting, I made you, fuck you, or fuck off. And I stuck it down in that little <laughs> box, and I was really proud of myself. I felt really empowered, and <clears throat> it wasn't a day or two later before I was called into Epic, my sister and I. And I guess we were the only kids around in the org, you know, those days. And at that time, at that, time, at that age, I, I hadn't really figured out. <laughs> I wasn't very smart enough to look at the big picture and go, oh, this could be tracked back to me. Right. <laughs> um, so... Um, yeah, I was called into ethics, and then, of course, um, they had something at that time, I don't know if they still do, it's called dead filing, and, and so I was threatened with dead filing, and that means that you um, are proven to be an enemy of Scientology, and you would be kicked out, banned uh, forever with no reentry. so you couldn't, it's not like a suppressive where you could come back and, you know, do these steps to to make things right, dead followed means you would be dead to Scientology and anyone in Scientology, including my mother. Right. So that was pretty serious, that, that conversation, um, that I that they could dead follow me, that they were going to give me another chance. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that, that's got to be kind of a, a, an unstable bridge to stand on where uh, you might go, good, dead follow me, I don't have to deal with this anymore, but then my family, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I didn't get to that point until... Later. 16 or, 7, 16 or 17, I was like, okay, do what you're going to do. Stop threatening me. Stop extorting me. I, I, nothing could be this bad, but when I was 6 and 7, I didn't. I, I only knew, you know, I only had my mother and my grandmother at that point, so I didn't want to lose them. So, so I, I apologize. I don't remember the order of events here. Uh, is this around the time that your grandfather got sick? Um, <clears throat> so a year or so went by that they were separated, and... Um, he, he's really sad. Um, in order to handle that, he had to come in and see the ethics officer. In order to, it, it, they couldn't even handle it amongst themselves, you know. And this is a non-scientologist. This is a non-scientologist, and the reason that we're not around him is because he was critical of Scientology. The, the cost of it, um, everything that was being required, that my mom was leaving us home alone. Um, he just didn't. He he was a critical thinker, and that's not okay in Scientology. And you're not allowed to say anything negative about it or question it. So, so we were separated from him because of this. And so he decided he wanted to reconcile and get the family back together. You know, even if he had to agree to be silent about Scientology, but he had to do it with at, at the org, at the org you know, through Scientology with you know the ethics officer. They had marriage counseling, and um, and agree to. Um, allow my grandma to spend thousands of dollars on Scientology from their earnings and their savings. Um, but he did. He wanted the family back together. And almost immediately, he was diagnosed with cancer. Wow. And um, they, my grandmother and um, someone called a chaplain from the org, spent a lot of time trying to get him to do services to resolve his illness. Because in Scientology, illness is not... Um, it's not an organic thing. It's caused. It's it's psychosomatic. It's caused by things you've done or things that have happened to you. So they want to sell you Scientology for that. They want you to get medical care. So they went round and round and tried things with him, and finally it just got so bad that he ended up um, um, in the hospital um, having to have everything removed surgically, and um, something went wrong in the surgery, and he was not expected to live. And they spent the last few days of his life um, counseling him to fully accept Scientology so that he could be in a knowing state um, and pick up a baby's body. And we had a friend who was pregnant, and so they agreed he would pick up this person's baby's body so we could come back directly into our fold and not have to wander around in the world trying to find Scientology again. So it could come directly back and, and, and proceed with us up the bridge and clear the planet. I, so, yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm so sorry to hear about your grandfather that way. 
Um, one thing I want to say is that it seems really sick and twisted about this is it's his last days on Earth. Right. And you know right. he doesn't right. buy into any of this crap. And he yeah, has he, he has no choice. He has to go along with this. He totally, he just loved my grandmother. He wanted, he wanted to be with her. Um, no, he didn't buy any of it. Um, but we were made to. We were made to um, call this child. Um, they, they named the child after my grandfather, Lewis. So we were made to call him Granddaddy or Lewis. Um, my mother called him Daddy. Um, it was really confusing. Even though we were used to some weird stuff, this was weird. Um, it was it was strange. And then to his funeral, um, we were really pressured for days before the funeral with, with his whole extended family to um, not cry and not dramatize in any way that we were supposed to set a good example of Scientology and that death is not the end. It's, you know, it's just a recycling of life and we live many lives and so there's nothing to fear about it. And they've been trying forever to get our extended family into Scientology because you're constantly being made to disseminate to people to get people in to buy services or to loan you money for your services. So it's a constant project that you're recruiting all the time. Um, and our family had been estranged because of that, um, too many times being pressured and not allowed to be critical or disagree or being begged for um, loans for, for money for, for our family to, to, to buy our bridges. Um, and so at the funeral, we were supposed to, it was supposed to be an opportunity to change their minds and show them, you know, what perfect family we were and how Scientology had changed and helped us. Um, and we just, my sister and I just felt, oh, we were made to wear white to the funeral, our whole family, white. Um, and, right. of course, everybody freaked out. Yeah, it was um, it was awful. They were furious and confused and um, upset with us. And my sister and I didn't know what was going on. We, everybody was crying and yelling and we were crying. And then it, it was awful. And our mother shuffled us out of there and our grandmother was left and, of course, it made things worse with the family. And um, then my sister and I were punished, assigned lower conditions, for creating hot as if we had done it, as right. if us crying. It's backwards. Had caused this thing to happen. It was really, it was awful. It was pretty traumatic. It, it's backwards. So if you wore black yeah, yeah, yeah. and cried, yeah. it'd be normal. Right. But wearing white and trying to not show emotion, they'd wonder what was wrong with you. Right, exactly. We were low toned. We were misemotional. We created a flap. Yeah, it was it was crap. It was really crap. So backwards. And in in and by this point, your mother is so sold. She did. You know, your mm-hmm. grandmother, your mother. They don't think anything of this. Mm-hmm. No, they were devout. They were so devout at that point. What's wrong with these people that they they don't see how well adjusted we are? Right, they're not ready for it yet. We're, we're, they're not ready. This is, too, this is too true for them. They can't handle this yet. So they have to go back out into the world and 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 suffer for a bit longer before they can see the truth. I mean, that's kind of what they keep telling you. Wow. Okay. Mhm. Um. You you did eventually. Did you ever go to like public schools or anything like that? Did you get any education? Yeah, we went to public school um, all the time that we were in San Francisco until we were, I think we left at 9 and 10 when we signed our SEER contract finally. Um, we, my sister really struggled in school, um, and I now know, you know, she really was suffering from depression. Um, I did not, I excelled for God knows what reason. Um, but we did attend really um faithfully until years later. Um, when we moved to L.A., we were enrolled in some really sketchy um, schools full of gangs, and we did skip from school at that point, and our mother was not around or involved, um, and we were able to kind of get away with that for a bit. But, um, but we did go to school, each of us, until we were in the C organization. And in the C organization, public school is not... 
it's it's not only not a priority, it's almost frowned upon as a distraction, uh, propaganda. Um, so so you they don't make sure that you go. I mean, in later years, I think they ended up having to make sure that kids go just to fulfill the legal, you know, um, part. But but it's not because they wanted you to have an education. The only education that, that's important is your Scientology education or your Sea Org education to learn how to be a better Sea Org member or a cadet to learn how, you know, more about Scientology. That's the only thing that they really support. And these schools that they create out in the world, these public... Uh, um, these private Scientology schools, they're just feeding pools for recruitment for Scientology and, and indoctrination, really. Um, mm. uh, it, it's remarkable um, what they've created. You've mentioned to me that uh, before that you went to, uh, that when you went to school, it's very similar to Claire Headley's story, is where uh, you were picked on for being different and you had to hide that you were a Scientologist. So, so this this most ethical religion on earth that you guys uh, had to uh, go by the letter of the law that's supposed to be the answer to to your eternity is something you can't even talk about. So we learned while we were still in San Francisco um, when we were handing out flyers on the street corners that if we told people what they were, they did not, it wouldn't take them out of our hands. So we learned to say other things to them. Here, this is for you. Here, would you like this? I mean, we're stupid little sweet kids. Um, But if you said, here, this is Scientology, take this thing, they'd throw it on the floor. So people were already getting, you know, onto it. We didn't know why. We just thought they were bad people or confused people, not ready for the truth. Um, And then uh, in our own own life at home, in our apartment building, um, we had some new neighbors that, you know, we couldn't play with after school, and we were trying to explain to them we had to go to the org, and they're like, what's an org? And we're like, oh, it's a place where our mother works doing Scientology. And they're like, what's Scientology? And we're like, I don't know. It's just a place our mother goes. (laughs) We didn't know, because it wasn't considered a religion back then. This was before they played the religious card. So it was just a place where our mom went to work, and um, they asked us some questions. And then we we tried to answer as best we could. They were a little bit older than us. But anyway, they, they told their mother. Their mother, I guess, explained what she had heard about Scientology and maybe that it was a cult. I didn't even know what a cult was back then. But then they started picking on us. And we learned then. So the, they threw me on the ground and knocked my front teeth out. Oh, my God. I knew I knew then I could not tell anyone I was in Scientology, that bad things would happen to me. So I was quiet about it from then on. So that was when I was seven. And then later, when we were uh, um, in Florida at the, and in the Sea Org, um, the Flag Land Base, we were getting beat up in school, <clears throat> one by one, all of us kids. Uh, and, and they took us on a Scientology bus, so that was a big giveaway. Oh, my God. We all went, we all went on this, this bus. So we couldn't conceal it. We had to change schools because the school could not protect us. But there was this whole thing going on in Clearwater where Scientology had come in and bought that property lying, hiding behind United Churches when it really was Church of Scientology, and that created, you know, a problem with the locals, and then they got into fights and disputes with the local paper, the Clearwater Sun, and then they got into local disputes with the mayor, Gabe Cesaris, yeah. and then the, the local people started picketing and protesting on Fort Harrison Avenue right outside the Fort Harrison Hotel. And the Scientologists and Sea members would go out and they created this carnival environment, setting, like selling popcorn and dressing in costumes to try and make it look like it was some weird street fair. It was bizarre. Those <laughs> parents were so upset, and they went home and told their kids, their kids came to school and beat the shit out of us. Now, when this happens, these because okay. it's not okay that these kids did that. You know, sure. this really... Uh, this really must, in your mind, sort of reinforce the world outside is is evil mentality that's totally. you know, driven totally. into you. Us against them, yeah, yeah. Which was what we had been told our entire lives, and it just got worse the older we got. That wogs were scary, wogs wogs were criminals, wogs were on drugs. 
Wogs were degraded beings. We didn't want to be like them. They would, you know, they would hurt us. They would harm us. And, and, and honestly, to our experience, that is what happened. Those kids beat me up. Those kids broke my teeth. Those men molested me. Those things happened. So it seemed true to me, and it seemed true to my mother. I mean, it, 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 it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. It actually seemed to be true. Wow. There's not a whole lot to be said there. I mean, because, again, you can never excuse kids beating up other kids that way, knocking your teeth out, not because of your religion or you're in a cult. You know, they don't, but these kids didn't know better. And uh, sure. it's good to know, it's, it's, it's good to remember that uh, really it goes back to Scientology. It's, you, people don't understand things, it scares them. So yep. we were, we were a bunch of idiots. We were doing the wrong thing. We, you know, we're, but but again, we're trying to cover up crap by calling it something good and then sell that to the public when it was always crap. Well, it's interesting. You talk about how you had to not say it was Scientology when you handed out the flyers. You'd hide it. It was Scientology. Right. That's actually something Scientology as an organization realizes. Hence all their front groups. Mm-hmm. You know, Winter Wonderland is going on right now, right? I know, I know. It's just crazy. It's so insane. If you say come to our Scientology seminar, uh, people won't come. If you say come to Winter Wonderland, the kids will see Santa, they'll come. And then they go, hey, these people are so nice. I never thought about it, but since you're being nice, let me check out your materials. And then the indoctrination uh, the, doc- the indoctrination begins. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and you know, to hear LRH explain it, he he's such a... He's such a good salesman of snake oil, but, you know, he'll tell you, on one hand, honesty is so important, but on the other hand, we have to do this in this way because these people are so fucked up. We can't help them by being direct. We have to bring them in softly. (laughs) And they're just teaching you to be liars and cheaters because the thing you're selling is of no value, and it's all a bunch of lies, but... But but yeah, he, you you buy into it, and he's he's covered the bases from every different angle. So you do what you think is right, and it's wrong. So you mentioned you signed up for Sea Org. Now a couple different ways of looking at this, I guess. But you signed up for Sea Org at nine and ten years old, and um, I think that's a little young. I think you'll hear Scientologists debate whether or not that's true. But I've heard a lot of people at a younger age were influenced to sign up at 10 years old or 9 years old. So back then, it wasn't unusual. <clears throat> back back then, you know, this was 1976. Um, they hadn't made all these changes about limitations on age. They, they weren't, I don't think they, they hadn't had legal backlash yet at that point, And they hadn't, you know, when they were on the ship or at St. Hill and they were getting people into the Sea Org originally. And they hadn't really covered what was going to happen to kids. Um, they were making it up as they went along, I think. And you can you can see, you know, Miriam covered some of these things, the policies that were written about kids as they started happening. Yep. Really, really interesting to see how it unfolded um, and how he explained how kids would be treated and how he explained you know, the disciplinary practice and how they'd be separated from their parents and how parents wouldn't have any direct control over them <clears throat> and how they'd be punished and how they, even even children, could be suppressive persons and could be punished and sent to the Rehabilitation Project Force once it was created. <clears throat> and then, you know, over time, um, how they could be exploited and, and what was expected of them was just like an adult. Um, and it, it, it just it created this perfect storm of of abuse and abandonment and neglect. And, you know, now you can look back and reflect on it. But the way that, and, and then, of course, the, you know, the, the kids getting moved farther and farther away from the parents in the Sea Org until they're talking about sending them off to Mexico and, living in Quonset huts um, yeah. because they're a distraction. They're no longer allowed on the property. They're, um, you know, they're taking up valuable resources and, 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 and affecting production and clearing the planet, which is the number one priority, of course. Um, and then they start enforcing abortions and you can't have children anymore. Um, 
to the point where then no children are allowed. But that was an evolution. That wasn't how it started. You know, it started with, oh, let's get all these people into Scientology and, and get them to join the Sea Org, and their kids will be future soldiers, and that's great. It just didn't work out that way because it doesn't work. You can't do that to kids and expect a good outcome, but they sure tried. It seems know? like a catch-22. It seems like they depend on that next generation now. Like, they're not getting a lot of outside using, people. They're using those schools as feeding pools now instead of, you know, having you be born into the Sea Org or mm-hmm. brought into the Sea Org um, at 10 or 6 or wh- whatever age we were allowed to join. Now I think it's more like 12. Um, so, But by the time we were 12 and in the Sea Org, that's not a good outcome. My sister and I ended up on the on the adult RPF at, at Flag, you know, and living in a garage and being treated like no child. I mean, if I thought our childhood could, could get any worse, um, that was hard. And, that you know, um, that can still happen to kids. They can still join at 12, not do well, be disciplined, end up there being abused and trafficked and suicidal um, like we were. It's it's not it's, it's still not fixed. But they, they've they've evolved and changed it so can't be born in. They don't have to pay for babies being raised. They don't have to let women have, you know, pregnancy leave. Um, they don't have to have nurseries. They don't have to have cadet orgs. Um, they can just bring you in later when you're a little more cooked as an egg and, and hopefully already indoctrinated because you've been raised in a Scientology family or you went to a Scientology school, and you'll be more prepared to just go straight to the Seerg and give your billion years. I, th- I feel like I skipped uh, your cadet org time. Was there anything specific you can tell us about the cadet org time that stood out to you? Um, so we were in the cadet org twice. We started in L.A. the first time, and um, it was... We, at first, honestly, we were excited. We thought, my mom said we were going to go live with kids. And we are like, yeah, we're not going to be home alone anymore, you know. Or right. We're not going to have to, we'll be able to be straightforward with some kids and say, we're Scientologists. They'll know that. We thought, maybe we found our peers. Maybe this is what, we didn't, we weren't excited about joining the Sierra by any means because we knew that it would be more work. But when she said we'd live with kids, that was like the silver lining to us. Okay. Other kids that are Scientologists. And, um. We got there, and it was just squalor. It was an old hotel that was falling apart, and the kids were angry and neglected and sick and not nurtured, not mentored. The only thing that was being given to them was Scientology was being shoved down their throat. So more of more ethics, more victim-blaming, more demands of production. Um, it, so it went from, you know, bad to worse for us. Um, and we we tried to just be quiet and not draw attention. And um, her mother went somewhere completely different. We didn't see her the whole time. If you got sick, you were sent to isolation and shamed for pulling an illness. And then also, though, um, punished for your stats dropping while you were in while you were sick in isolation and um, you know have to do lower conditions and catch up and make amends to your group for having your stats be down because you were given jobs immediately that's all we did was work and clean and graph our stats and the study was about cleaning and being better CRG members there was no actual education you know no no, no, no three R's no writing with took or reading but just Scientology 24-7. Um, there's a lot of sexual activity going on between the kids, but mostly the older ones we didn't get affected. Um, and just real abuse. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know. Now looking back, I go, oh, my God, how could anybody do that to children? But, you know, kids setting fires and kids trying to harm themselves and harm others and Getting when the parents or not the parents, but the adults came, the cadet coordinator was just getting interrogated constantly, um, and writing up those reviews and writing knowledge reports and you know ratting each other out for so and so said or did this. It was really awful. 
But luckily, we were only there for a few months. And um, our mother was found to be disqualified for the year because of LSD. And so she had to leave, and we were allowed to go with her because we were so young. And so we had another year of public school, which was a highlight of our lives at that point, um, just to be around other n- normal kids, even though they weren't like us. Right. It, it was it was like a vacation, you know, to go to public school. And there was food there, and the lunch ladies gave us extra food because we didn't have breakfast. Um, or, you know, kids just had normal hobbies and we got to play and things like that that we didn't get to do at home or in our normal lives. And then we went back. Um, my mother somehow was able to navigate around her, her disqualification for LSD, and we went um, all moved as a family to Clearwater. My aunt and uncle were already there because they'd been on the Apollo ship, which had come ashore, and they bought that property in, in Florida. And so we joined them there. My grandmother came too, and um, we did a second bout of the kids or my sister and I. Now we were 12 and 13. But before very long, my mother was found disqualified again for the same reason. It's bizarre. So she's out now living locally in Clearwater, but we're stuck because we're older now. We're 12 and 13. We weren't allowed to leave with her this time. Um, my aunt and uncle were our acting guardians, although it wasn't legal. And we saw our mother on special occasions, like birthdays and Christmas and things. Um, it didn't go well. Very, it, the, the cadet up there was better because I think we were encapsulated within the Fort Harrison Hotel, so we weren't off isolated in our own building by ourselves in the beginning. So we were around all the other adults and parents. We lived right off of the garage in a cabana, and it was bunks to the ceiling stacked everywhere. Um, so we still lived amongst the other kids, and we worked amongst the other kids, but we weren't isolated off on some other property in the beginning. And um, so we still saw our aunt and uncle at dinner time. And, and at that point, you were allowed to have family time, which was an extra hour after dinner. But we always spent that time with them kind of interrogating us of, over all the things we'd done wrong, um, think people that had reported on us for being late or making mistakes or saying things we shouldn't say. So it wasn't fun. It wasn't like little family time that we enjoyed. Um, but pretty quickly, for some reason, I don't know why, I'd love to know at some point, uh, the cadet org was all what was called sent on mission and assigned jobs throughout the orgs with all the adults. So instead of working with each other as kids and managing each other like you do in the cadet org, we were sent off into orgs with adults. And um, we didn't do well, my sister and I. We struggled. We, we didn't know how to be Sea Org members. We hadn't been trained. We'd only been in the cadet org for a really brief amount of time. And um, we didn't fit in. We were late. We made mistakes. We talked back. We, um, we were kids. And we got in trouble. And we got in worse trouble. And we ended up in front of a, a, a group of adults called the fitness board where they decide whether you're fit or not and they, you know, went through our folders and accused us of all these crimes and, um, you know, we cried and um, didn't have anyone there to represent us and we were just a bunch of strangers and kept threatening us with worse and worse punishments if we didn't somehow suddenly become shining, productive seared members. And... Um, we struggled along that way for months and ended up being assigned to full-time hard labor, which means being assigned to the deck. Um, and we still didn't improve, and the next threat was the rehabilitation project force, and we ultimately ended up there, which meant living in the garage and being under watch 24 hours a day and not being able to speak to any other children, any other adults, certainly not our family. Um, and just doing punitive labor, which is really hardcore, really hardcore labor. Um, and this, uh, this garage, this is, I've heard this mentioned before, uh, the Fort Harrison garage, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that hotel where so, all the public comes to do their amazing upper-level services, you know, there's a garage attached to it. When people are living there. Sure, this is, 
Yes, we lived there when we were on the deck, so when we were being punished originally, um, and there was a, a level of the garage that was all staff storage and motorcycles, and there was a weight bench, and they set up bunks there. And so if you were punished, um, it may have been called pig's birthing at that time, which is just a punishment. Um, we lived in bunks in the garage there first with other kids, other adults, and then when we were finally assigned to the rehabilitation project course, we were moved to a different location in the garage that was like a, like a lean-to made of plywood um, right up against the concrete walls and surrounded by cars and um, just made to sleep in the garage. So there's all kinds of sanitary and health implications that can go with that. Um, so to the point to where I think you said that... Um, there have been investigations into that location, and they'll clean it up and make it look like no one's been living there. Yeah, so we so so they hope to get tipped off. I I don't know how, and I don't even I don't know if they have people employed at these you know different agencies or they just pay people off to do it. But we would get tipped off usually two to three days in advance of inspection, whether it was child protective services that were coming or it was the health inspector, um, we'd get tipped off and they would call an all-hands briefing. So they'd make all staff mandatory briefing and then do an evolution where you had to stay up until it was done, no matter what. And everyone would clean and reorganize and put storage on top of the bunks or move the bunk beds out completely, block rooms off that were overpopulated and call them storage. Um, take bunks out of dorm rooms so it looked like they were, you know, had a lower population. Um, yeah. And and us kids were, you know, um, coached on how to speak to them if they spoke to us, you know, how to tell them that we don't work past a certain hour. We attend school this many days. We don't work more than this many hours per week, which is, of course, all false. Um so we're just taught to lie. So what are you thinking there? Are you thinking, like, these people are so evil, they're going to find every excuse to take me away from my mother. So you're talking about um, these people, the people coming in to investigate. So you need to just so, go ahead and follow these instructions because you don't want to be taken from your parents. So my mom was already gone, so that wasn't an issue. But we were, of course, it's just the same party line that logs are evil and they're trying to make us fail and they're trying to harm mankind because we're making a difference and they can't stand it. They're all suppressive. And so they're going to come in here and find any reason they can to hurt us and to stop us. So that's a rationalization. Any, anything we do, any lying, any cheating, any stealing, anything we do is right because it's the greatest good for Scientology. So you don't question it at all? No, God, no. But, but the thing is, not only would you not question it, because you totally believe it, because you've heard it for your whole life. Right. But if you did, you get in worse trouble. You get punished. You're not going to be the squeaky wheel or the whistleblower. Right. Bad things happen to people that do what they're not told, you know. Unless you're Melissa Paris, and then you're going to do everything. <laughs> so... <laughs> So you get to the point to where um, you're always in trouble. Um, yeah. Did anyone ever say, is there ever a time you did a project in, in the Sea Org and they said, good job? Yeah, probably. Stupid stuff. I mean, as long as your stats were up. It's all it's about okay. stats. Yeah. It's all about your statistics. So if you were producing and you were achieving the goal or the target that you were assigned, yes, you got a quick attaboy. You know, you 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 had to write a, a request for a day off every two weeks, and your stats had to be up, and you had to have no negative, you know, no chits or knowledge reports written on you. Um, so you couldn't be in, in ethics handling or in any lower condition. But if your stats were up and you weren't in a lower condition, and everything was okay in the org that would allow you to be off that day, then you could be off that day. So that was your reward, to sometimes get a day off every two weeks if everything was perfect. 
Wow. Okay. And of course, uh, the standards are so high. I imagine there wasn't a lot of time off. How do you get your de- your stats up every single week? How do you keep someone from? How do you not? How do you be perfect all the time? So right. No one reports you. It's just, or or even if you did do those things, but your org, your overall org was in a lower condition because its stats weren't up, which is beyond your control because you're not the hundred people in your org. Um, then you wouldn't get it. Then you'd be on rice and beans. So you're being punished for everybody else's failure to produce or things with that weren't within your control. Wow. So you did eventually end up on the RPF. So we were on the RPF for a few months that time. Um, the whole time they were telling us, if we failed, if we left, we would be the enemy, we would be degraded beings, we would become criminals, we would become prostitutes, if you can imagine telling children that. Um, our mother would be better off without us, which was the worst thing anyone could ever say to me. That that was heartbreaking. Um, <clears throat> but, but finally, um, we failed and failed and failed so much that they did end up fitness boarding us off and they offload you, which means you're not good enough. Get out. And they sent us back to our mother, and we were relieved. Except then she was mad at us for being a liability to our group. And so we were, you know, in lower conditions there. Um, and um, made to get jobs right away so that we could stay in exchange with her. And so we just started working. But we did get to go back to public school uh, for a little bit. And... Um, of course, this time didn't tell anyone that we were Scientologists and um, made some friends, and that was nice, and got exposed to drugs finally and saw that going on. So that was, you know, this prophecy that Scientology was telling me. I got to see that that did happen. There were kids out there struggling that were having problems with their family that were getting on drugs. So I was always a little bit terrified about that. And um, Before too long, an amnesty came out, which is where the C organization says, Anyone that left before, we're going to forgive you and let you come back to us and try again. Um, and um, my mother made us go back again. And uh, she didn't come with us the first time, although she would again later. But she sent us back, and we nothing had changed. We weren't any different. If anything, we lived in the log world now, so we were less dedicated and less on purpose. So we go back and try again to you know, get put through the paces of trying to be Suyark members and fail and get kicked out again. And that happened a couple of times, um, just when we would kind of get settled into our lives as non suyark members, uh, an amnesty would come out and our mother would send us back again. Just really over and over, just keep getting recycled. If I... It was her dream. It was her dream to do the most she could for Elrond Hubbard. And she had been sold on the idea that being in the Sea Org was the ultimate, ultimate of all purposes. And also, though, I think now, looking back, it was a financial solution for her because it meant free room and board, free Scientology services, right, and someone else parenting her children, I'm afraid. But by this time, it's become just the most comfortable way to do things and so she knows now. For That's her, for her, yeah. Never never for us. We right. we would have we would have if we had known that we had rights, we had no idea that, that anything that was being done to us was illegal. You know, we were pulled out of school at fourteen and fifteen. We didn't we didn't know that was against the law. I mean we kind of knew it was against the law in a sense that Scientology told us not to tell anyone you know, when they would come on these to inspect the Fort Harrison, the, these briefings we went to, they were, we were told never to tell anyone that we didn't do schooling. So we knew that the outside world thought it was wrong. We just didn't know that it was our legal right to be educated and that we should have been educated and that we should have been in school and we shouldn't have been working 80 hours a week and, you know, that we shouldn't be living in the garage and that we shouldn't be being verbally abused by grown people constantly. We didn't know. We didn't know that that was wrong. You know, it felt wrong. We didn't know it was illegal. Right. If we had known, I think we would have 
I think at certain points when we were so unhappy, we would have done something about it. But we were so paranoid and afraid of the outside world and even our extended family. We had a my yeah. father's mother um, and and father that would check in with us annually and give us a Christmas check, at, you know, something, um, and send us a card. And we would speak to them every once in a while. If we had known that we could tell them what was happening to us and they could help us, we would have told them. We just didn't know that we could tell them. We didn't know. Well, there's an uncertainty also as to what, what will happen to you at that point. Right. We knew we'd lose our mother if we ever you know, did anything too wrong. And so we were always um, straddling that. We didn't want to. Um, we ended up losing our aunt, uncle, and grandmother um, in 1982, I think, um, when they did something wrong in the sewer. My grandmother had a medical issue, and she was a registered nurse, and she knew that her symptoms were um, concerning, and she kept trying to get time off to go and get medical care, and they were All right, so we're going to stop right there where the grandmother went off to get medical care. Uh, We'll pick up right from there in two weeks, on Thursday and two weeks after the holiday, to start the the new year off with part two of Christy Gordon. And we'll hear more about her grandmother and her family uh, being out of Scientology. We'll hear about how she got out of Scientology and her uh, her journey uh, to finally being free from uh, the chains of of Scientology and actually rediscovering her mother again in probably the worst condition she ever seen her in. And, um, of course, 10 questions. So it'll be an interesting uh, part two coming up. You remember tomorrow, the Christmas edition of Come Get Some, uh, 23rd, tomorrow, Saturday, at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Lori Hodgson, for the first time in the year and a half, will talk about how she lost her children to Scientology disconnection. And uh, also, you may know the story about how the squirrel buster showed up at the doorstep of Marty Rathbun. You've seen the video of him answering the door, but do you know what went on on the other side of that door inside Marty Rathbun's home? Part of Lori's story, and it's relevant to her kids. Lori was in the home that day. You'll hear everything that happened leading up to and after Marty Rathbun opened the door on that video. That and much more special wishes and uh, goodwill towards her children, some conversation there. Uh, she will have a message for them and a message for other disconnected families uh, as we try to turn a mother's heartbreak into a mother's hope and try to get uh, well everyone to get their families back together uh, heading into the new year. Until tomorrow, uh, that about sums it up. See you then. You have been listening to Come Get Some Extra on Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, YouTube, and many other streaming services where available. As always, stay connected, and that about sums it up.